Okay, assalamu alaikum and welcome back to our next lecture. Remember, this is our series on DNA and design. And just to take a step back for a minute, the big idea here is that there is a contention between two camps. There is the intelligent design camp who believes that DNA and all life, and of course, the physical universe, is the product of intelligent design. We as Muslims believe that it is the creative activity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other camp contends that everything we see, DNA on up, is the result of blind, random, materialistic or naturalistic processes. And they accuse us of being unscientific. And that if we were to simply follow the science, we would inevitably come to the conclusion that the Darwinian scheme of blind chance with natural selection acting on random mutations is sufficient to explain the complexity of life. Our counter contention is that the more we learn about science, the deeper we go, the more plausible the design argument becomes, not less plausible. And DNA is a perfect example of that. And the title of today's lecture is, uh, or this lecture series really, is Disteleology and the Issue of Junk DNA. Now, what is disteleology? Disteleology is a term that describes one of the arguments of the uh, materialistic camp. And by materialistic, I don't mean you know, lovers of money, etc. I mean those who believe in the random materialistic origin of the order that we see in nature. And disteleology is the idea that you look at design flaws and say, if this is the result of intelligent design, why would an intelligent designer design a flawed system? Uh, a random process, of course, will have its goods and its bads and easily explains an imperfect and flawed system, but one that somehow works anyway. We will look at an issue that was central in the disteleology argument, um, which is the issue of so-called junk DNA. But before we get into the details of that issue, I would like to just make a remark uh, about sort of the arrogance of using the disteleology argument. Number one, we believe that we as humans with our current state of knowledge are fit to judge what is optimal and what is not optimal. And science has shown us over and over that that is a big mistake. And number two, we think that we are fit to judge the purpose behind the creation. We make an assumption that things have to be optimal. And perhaps the creator wanted to create something in a less than perfect state. For example, we know that we have been created to be tested with things like disease. All of us will be tested by death, etc. And so it is arrogant on multiple levels, but I'm not so much worried about the arrogance, I'm worried about it being wrong. And there is no better issue to demonstrate that than the issue of junk DNA. So what is this junk DNA? What does that term even mean? Well, you may remember it from your biology classes. And after um, Watson and Crick uh, discovered the structure of DNA and people began mapping the DNA, uh, they came to a sort of shocking realization. Remember, the scheme we've talked about is that DNA gets transcribed into RNA and then RNA gives the code to make proteins, a fairly linear uh, orderly arrangement where DNA goes to RNA, RNA goes to protein, and the function of DNA that we talked about is to make protein. So junk DNA is a term for genomic DNA, DNA that does not encode protein, uh, and whose function, if it has one, is not well understood. And that was the definition in the 70s and the 80s, and we'll get a little bit more into it. But the idea is, from what we've said before, you may have gotten the picture 
that all DNA gets turned into RNA, which gets turned into protein, and that each segment of DNA, uh, quote unquote, a gene, is responsible for making one of the proteins essential to life. And that is the view of the so-called central dogma. But it was soon discovered that DNA has many regions which do not code for protein. And on the diagram on your left, you can see two types of regions, regions in between genes. The genes here are coded in red, and these are called non-coding regions. And even within a single gene, there are areas known as introns that do not end up coding for protein. And the red areas are known as exons which do end up coding for protein. So both between genes and within genes, there are segments of the DNA which are not expressed as a protein. They don't end up making uh, the code to link amino acids together. And one of the special types of these non-coding um, areas are known as pseudogenes, and we'll talk a little bit more about them later, but they are basically segments of DNA that look almost like a gene, but may have some mutation or some defect and don't get expressed, but they are still stuck within our DNA. So the big surprise then was that there were portions of DNA which seemed non-functional. They didn't code for proteins. And as more of the human genome, which is a term for the entirety of the DNA, was explored, an even more shocking discovery was made, which is that only about 2% of the human genome codes for proteins. The rest was called junk. And in fact, the term junk DNA was coined by the geneticist uh, Susumu Ono in 1972. And it quickly made its way into the textbooks uh, for teaching of high school and college students. So for example, the well-known biologist Kenneth Miller, Miller, who was author of a very well-known biology textbook for high school, uh, said the following. Quote, the human genome is littered with pseudogenes, gene fragments, orphan genes, junk DNA, and so many repeated copies of pointless DNA sequences that it cannot be attributed to anything that resembles intelligent design. So the finding that 98% of the genome did not code for proteins led the vast bulk of biologists at the time in the early 70s when these discoveries were made and through the 80s and 90s to say, number one, that most of the DNA is junk. It is sort of these carry over useless remnants as the DNA evolved from the most primitive organisms to the human. And the classic dysteleology argument that given that most DNA is junk and useless, that clearly this cannot be attributed to intelligent design. So here we have the classic dysteleology argument, and it was not only made by uh, Kenneth Miller, who I believe is professor of biology at Brown University, but by many others. So for example, in a book called Why Darwin Matters by Michael Shermer, we have the following quote, and forgive me for taking the time to read it, but I think we really have to sort of get into and understand how pervasive this, tele this dysteleological thinking was, uh, and really still is because most of the public is still in this mindset. Uh, quote, we have to wonder why the intelligent designer added to our genome junk DNA repeated copies of useless DNA, orphan genes, gene fragments, tandem repeats, and pseudogenes, none of which are involved directly in the making of a human being. In fact, of the entire genome, it appears that only a tiny percentage is actively involved in useful protein production. Rather than being intelligently designed, the human genome looks more and more like a mosaic of mutations, fragment copies, borrowed sequences, and discarded strings of DNA that were jerry-built over millions of years of evolution.
And this is the thinking which was transmitted to me in high school and to me as an undergraduate studying biology. Let's look at one more quote, uh, because of course the implications of the scientific um, uh, findings for faith are clear. And uh, Philip Kitcher, professor of philosophy at Columbia University, wrote a book called Living with Darwin, and you see its subtitle, Evolution, Design, and the Future of Faith. And here are some quotes from the book. If you were designing the genomes of organisms, you would certainly not fill them up with junk. The most striking feature of the genome analysis we now have is how much apparently non-functional DNA there is. And from the Darwinian perspective, all this is explicable. The molecular equivalent of tinkering that is pervasive in the history of life at the anatomical level over the history of life, the residues of past tinkering accumulate in the genome. And so you see now the, the issue before us is how can we, as people of faith, claiming intelligent design, explain, uh, explain away this notion of junk DNA? And the answer to that question is not by hand-waving or apologetics, it's by doing more science, that we need to seek the truth. And as people then started to do more science at the turn of the new century in the early 2000s, papers began popping up saying, guess what, it seems that we need to think beyond the proteome. And this is a paper in Genome Biology, a very, very highly respected uh, genetics and biology journal uh, from the year 2002. What is the proteome? The proteome is the portion of the DNA that makes proteins. But it turns out that in the late 90s, early 2000s, it became more and more apparent that this DNA, which was not involved in making proteins, was actually transcribed into RNA. Uh, initially, the, those who were talking about junk DNA were saying that this junk DNA was just sitting there and it did not get transcribed into RNA. And then that, uh, of course, could not make protein. But it came as a great surprise that actually most of the genome is transcribed. About 80% of the DNA is made into RNA. Only about 2% of that RNA goes on to make protein. The rest of it is called non-coding RNA. It doesn't code for protein. But the question then immediately arose, why would an organism fine-tuned by evolution bother transcribing useless DNA into RNA if that RNA had no purpose? That would be a big waste. And papers started coming out saying, hey, it seems that this RNA, which does not code for protein, which is being transcribed from what we thought was junk DNA, actually does have some function. And so in this paper, for example, we see it says non-protein coding RNAs are known to play significant roles. All of a sudden, it was discovered, number one, the quote unquote junk DNA was actually transcribed into RNA. And number two, although this RNA did not make protein, so-called non-coding RNA, it did have significant functions. For example, controlling whether a gene is transcribed and to what extent. So you can have a non-coding uh, segment of DNA, which gets transcribed into RNA. That RNA does not code for protein, but that segment of RNA goes back and interacts with DNA and quote unquote helps turn on or turn off 
a gene which does code for protein. And we'll talk a little bit more about that further. The point to take away now is that beginning in the early 2000s, we began to realize that the DNA does get transcribed into RNA and that that RNA, which does not go on to make protein, actually does have very significant function in the cells. Here's another paper from 2006, uh, co-authored by uh, John Maddock, uh, who was really instrumental in discovering uh, that non-coding RNA does have significant function. And this is published in uh, Human Molecular Genetics. Uh, and again, quotes from this paper, these RNAs, and by these RNAs, we mean the non-coding RNAs, which were thought to be the product of junk DNA. So these RNAs, including those derived from introns, appear to comprise a hidden layer of internal signals that control various levels of gene expression in physiology and development. RNA regulatory networks may determine most of our complex characteristics. So it turns out that these non-coding RNAs are essential for turning on and off genes. Remember, your brain and your heart and your liver all carry the same genetic information, the same 46 chromosomes. Yet they do very different things. Why is that? Because some genes are turned off and others are turned on in each of these different cells so that they can do their appropriate work. And if they all carry the same information, how do we then get this level of differentiation? Which ones turn off? Which ones turn on? Which ones will function as nerve cells, muscle cells, connective tissue, um, endocrine cells that will release hormones and so forth? Well, it turns out that this is the function of the rest of the DNA. This immense, complex, interrelated regulatory network, which, as John Maddox says, is probably the thing that determines most of our complex characteristics. Now, the important thing to realize is the delay factor. What do I mean by that? I mean that when the forefront of science begins to make discoveries, there's a very definite delay until that reaches the general public. And the more easy the idea is to understand, the shorter the delay, the harder the idea is to understand, the longer the delay. So for example, quantum mechanics was developed uh, early in the 20th century, about 100 years ago, give or take, and still has not really filtered into the education of today's high school and college students because the ideas are rather complex. Here, these things about junk DNA began to be discovered in the early 2000s. And then in 2019, in a respected popular science um, journal, Advanced Science News, we now find an article that that quote unquote junk DNA is full of information. And so that's why it is important for us as people of faith who are interested in science to try to be at the cutting edge. That's why these lectures are so detailed. And so as our knowledge progressed, and by our knowledge, I, I mean the, the, the cutting edge of molecular biology, all of a sudden there was a definite perspective change. And Francis Collins, who was former head of the Human Genome Project that decoded the human DNA and currently head of the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and by the way, a man of deep faith, he was initially a big proponent of the idea of junk DNA. So even a person of deep faith goes along with the science of his day, so to speak and said that this clearly supports the Darwinian evolutionary mechanism. Now, fast forward to 2010, and what is he saying? He says the discoveries of the past decade 
little known to most of the public, and this is the point I want to stress to you, and that's why we're going into this detail, have completely overturned much of what used to be taught in high school biology. If you thought the DNA molecule comprised thousands of genes, but far more junk DNA, think again. And in 2015, he came back and said, I would say in terms of junk DNA, we don't use that term anymore because I think it was pretty much a case of hubris to imagine that we could dispense with any part of the genome as if we knew enough to say it wasn't functional. There will be parts of the genome that are just, you know, random collections of repeats, etc. Uh, and, and you get the point of what uh, he is saying here. So you can see that as science advanced, there was a perspective change. I hope this reminds you of our second lecture in this series about the dysteleology argument regarding the organization of the human retina when we talked about the eyeball. People said, oh, how could an intelligent designer possibly put the nerve uh, sheath axons in front of the cells that are receiving the light and so forth? This is clearly an engineering flaw. This clearly points to random evolution. It works, but it's highly imperfect. And then as science advanced, it was discovered that this was actually a design feature, not a design flaw for the reasons that we covered in that lecture. So we see the exact same story playing out again in the realm of this junk DNA. And why am I focusing on junk DNA? Well, we're going to focus, inshallah, on a lot of things regarding DNA. But junk DNA was the big canon that the naturalistic materialist scientists were using against the proponents of intelligent design that obviously this is the smoking gun that shows that there cannot be intelligent design. And here I have a sort of long quote for you. We won't read the whole quote together, but just if you're interested in some numbers, again, from a book that Francis Collins wrote, The Language of Life, published in 2010, I'd like to just sort of focus um, a little bit on the, the meaning here and some of the middle of the quote. He's saying that these long non-coding regions of DNA can sometimes be hundreds of thousands or millions of base pairs. And those were referred to in the past as gene deserts because there were no segments of DNA that coded for protein. So there were no functional genes. So it was like a vast desert of DNA base pairs that was sort of arid and barren and useless. And then he comes and says, these regions are not just filler, however. They contain many of the signals that are needed to instruct a nearby gene about whether it should be on or off at a given developmental time in a given tissue. Um, and so uh, you see then that over a span of about 10 years or so, the perspective completely changed. And um, here I just wanted to share with you this uh, beautiful paper in uh, the journal Science. And those of you who are in the scientific world know that the two most respected scientific journals are Science and Nature. Uh, and this article really says it all. The ENCODE project writes eulogy for junk DNA. The ENCODE project is the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. It's an acronym. And it basically found that 80% of the human genome serves some purpose, biochemically speaking. And so the ENCODE project really kind of put the nail in the coffin and wrote the eulogy for the idea of junk DNA. And uh, here I'm just giving you a, a blow up from the introduction to, to uh, this article. And if you look at the second paragraph, it says this week, 30 research papers, including six in Nature and additional papers published by Science, sound the death knell for the idea that our DNA is mostly littered with useless bases. And it talks about the ENCODE project and how it found that 80% of the human genome serves some purpose and uh, then quotes an ENCODE researcher uh, 
saying, quote, I don't think anyone would have anticipated even close to the amount of sequence that ENCODE has uncovered that looks like it has functional importance. And so with that, I would like to end the first of um, these two lectures on the idea of junk DNA, uh, because I don't want to make any lecture too long. And inshallah, in the next lecture, we'll try to get into a little bit more uh, detail, because you see that without getting into detail, um, we really can't get a proper understanding. Of course, we won't get into the detail that molecular biologists do, but we should get into the detail that educated laypersons um, should have and God knows best. Thank you and salamu alaikum.